Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our Accessibility 101 webinar for Canadian Public Library staff. My name is Rianne LaPere. I am the Braille and Accessibility Testing Coordinator at the National Network for Equitable Library Service. Um, I recognize that everybody is tuning in from so many different places across Canada. And uh, I'd like to say that I'm based in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree and the homeland of the Métis Nation. My pronouns are she, her. I'm fair skinned with a few freckles. I have blue eyes and straight shoulder length brown hair. And co-presenting -pre co today is Kai Lee and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, my name is Kai. Uh, I also work at NELS, National Network for Equitable Library Services. And um, my pronouns are he, him, uh, and uh, I'm currently in Markham right now. So uh, I recognize the city of Markham is situated upon traditional territories of the uh, Anishinaabe peoples and of the Sunni peoples. Uh, these territories are covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, the First Nations community in closest proximity to the city of Markham are the Chippewas of uh, Georgina Island. Um, and in terms of a description, uh, I'm a young Asian male with black hair. The Public Library Accessibility Resource Center Project, or PLARC, is a collaborative project that is funded by the Government of Canada co-led by the Center for Equitable Library Access, CELA, and the National Network for Equitable Library Service, NELS, in partnership with eBound. The goal of this project is to create a consolidated resource center focused on the education and training of library staff across the country on the importance of accessibility. And pictured on this slide, we have um, the logos for NELS and CELA. So today's webinar will cover the following topics, introduction to disabilities, introduction to accessibility, including physical and digital accessibility, introduction to accessible formats, strategies for inclusive events, and what you can do now for free. As defined in the Accessibility or Accessible Canada Act, disability means any impairment, including a physical, mental, intellectual, cognitive, learning, communication, or sensory impairment, or a functional limitation, whether permanent, temporary, or episodic in nature, or evidence or not, that in interaction with a barrier hinders a person's full and equal participation in society. And there are different types of disabilities, including cognitive, physical mobility, blindness, low vision, speech, and hearing. And sometimes these are medical causes. There are medical causes for these disabilities, such as cerebral palsy, dysgraphia, macular degeneration, autosclerosis, and dysarthria. And pictured on this side, on this slide, are uh, five equilateral triangles in differing colors. The first one is blue with a line drawing of a brain inside of it, representing cognitive disabilities. The second one is purple. Uh, with a line drawing of a person in a wheelchair inside of it, representing people with physical or mobility disabilities. Uh, the third one is teal, with a line drawing of an eye inside, representing people um, who are blind or have low vision. The fourth one is red, with a line drawing of a person speaking inside of it, representing speech disabilities. And the last one is a yellow with a drawing, a line drawing of an ear inside of it representing hearing impairments. Uh, together, these triangles without the drawings make the logo we use for the project. So this all means that there's a broad range of abilities out there with no one size fits all solution. Accessibility is about flexibility. So when working with people with disabilities, it's important to consider person first identity versus identity first language to facilitate respectful interactions. So for example, patron with a print disability would be person first versus dyslexic patron would be identity first. Always ask each person what they prefer, but when in doubt, mirror how the individual refers to themselves. Avoid using synonyms for the word 
disability or when referring to a specific disability. For example, do not use differently abled, handicapable, visually challenged, etc. These synonyms can be condescending, condescending and unhelpful. The term vision loss, uh, which is used by a few charities and agencies, uh, is somewhat of a contentious term in the uh, blind and low vision community uh, due to the fact that some individuals um, who were born blind or with low vision never had full sight to begin with, so they didn't lose anything. Also, they may see themselves as complete or whole individuals. The Canadian government, though, uses person first language as their default. If you're planning a program and the presenter has a disability, ask if they'd like their disability disclosed. And if so, how would they like to be identified? This is be a best practice for all types of inclusion. For example, uh, autistic person or a person who has autism. So our identity first or person first versus identity first. Uh, and uh, Joey or Joseph, which is not necessarily specifically disability related, but um, all these details uh, are important to show that uh, you are listening to them and that uh, you care. If you're able, consider using or creating a notes section and a patron profile to include identification preferences, uh, include identification preferences so that all staff can see them. Uh, I would caution though that uh, some people in the disability community uh, may not like this. And so this should be optional. And uh, if this idea is implemented, um, this should, uh, uh, this should be considered very carefully. Uh, in interview or hiring situations, show that you're willing to offer accommodations. Uh, ask everyone in an inviting manner, are there any accommodations you need for the job or interview? Uh, or if you require any accommodations, uh, please let us know. Uh, while some needs can be complex, many are not. Asking goes a very long way. Accessibility refers to the design of products, devices, services, or environments which enables all people to participate fully in society without barriers. Accessibility also entails the identification and removal of barriers, be they physical, technological, procedural, attitudinal, or environmental, which inhibit people's participation in activities or in daily life. For something to be inclusive of people with disabilities, it must be accessible. Accessibility is essential and not an after, an add-on or afterthought. When it comes to physical spaces, access to physical spaces can include things like entrances and exits, play areas and maker spaces, washrooms, offices and conference rooms, uh, and access to equipment can include things like elevators, handrails, signage, computers, printers, and photocopiers. The Canadian Federation of Library Associations, CFLA, has guidelines on library and informational services for people with disabilities, including physical spaces, and here we've provided a link to that. Inclusive design. So there are seven principles of inclusive design uh, and these are useful uh, to help guide the design of physical spaces. So first one is equitable use. The design is useful to people with diverse abilities. Flexible use, which is the second one, the design is accommodating to a wide range of preferences and abilities. Third is simple and intuitive. Easy to understand regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language, skills, or current concentration level. Fourth is perceptible information. The design communicates 
necessary information efficiently to the user, regardless of the ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. Next is tolerance for error. The design minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. Um, so next is low physical effort. The, the design can be used uh, efficiently and comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue. Size and space for approach and use. Uh, so this is, um, or this refers to the appropriate size and space um, being provided uh, for approach, reach, manipulation, and use, regardless of the user's body size, posture, or mobile mobility. So what can you do to make your physical spaces in the library accessible? Well, ensure the space between shelving and furniture is wide enough for people using mobility aids to move around both in and out of shelving, not backwards. So this of course means that uh, there should be enough space for them to turn. Uh, this is also important to consider during special events when the space may be rearranged or furniture added. Consider removing books from the top shelves that cannot be reached from a sitting position and using that space for displayed materials instead. Consider integrating accessible collections such as DAISY or Braille from CELA and NELS into the rest of the collection. This also creates a great opportunity for inclusive conversations about this. So remove clutter and visual clutter for increased mobility, ease of browsing, and to help make environments less overstimulating. Uh, consider creating sensory friendly library times. Um, consult with people with disabilities or advocacy organizations and consider the competing needs of people with disabilities. Uh, remember though, it's a balancing act for a large spectrum of needs. We can't do 100% of what everybody wants, but our aim is to prevent barriers to access. And so uh, we want to do our best. So of course, uh, this leads us right into digital accessibility. Similar to physical accessibility, digital accessibility refers to full access to digital content, which enables all people to participate regardless of disability. Digital accessibility is more than just the assistive technology that people use to access digital content. It's about the content itself being accessible. Digital content that has been created to Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, in combination with usability testing performed by qualified individuals with lived experience, will produce the best digital experiences for all users. WCAG was developed with the goal of providing a single shared standard for web content accessibility that meets the needs of individuals, organizations, and governments internationally. Even though WCAG is a voluntary guideline, it has been embedded into many legislations around the world, making it a required standard. And while we've just been focusing on WCAG in the last couple seconds, uh, you'll uh, we'll, we'll also talk about accessibility for documents as well. So part of this equation of access is the assistive technology. Assistive technology refers to the products, equipment, and systems that enhance reading, learning, working, and daily living for persons with disabilities. We have some examples here. So screen readers, for example, uh, are software that reads the elements on the screen of a computer or mobile device using text-to-speech technology, enabling a blind or low vision person to use a computer or mobility device independently to access applications and websites. 
refreshable braille displays is a piece of hardware device that which offers uh, which often connects to a computer or mobile device and translates text into braille almost instantly. It does this with help from a screen reader's braille features. Braille is read by touch, therefore this setup is suitable for blind, low vision, or deafblind users. Screen magnification and enhancement software. Uh, it magnifies elements on digital or electronic screens and allows users to adjust other visual settings, such as contrast, cursor appearance, etc., increasing visibility and usability for low vision users. So here we're going to uh, do a quick live demo of uh, screen reader and braille display. Um, so uh, give me one moment while I set this up. Um, and uh, the reason why we're doing this is because in the past we've uh, found that uh, showing some of these demos uh, of how things work uh, can help people get a better sense of uh, what we're talking about. So what you're hearing is my screen reader uh, talking at a very uh, fast speech rate. Um, and uh, I'm just going to slow it down. Audio settings drop down button. Mute currently unmuted. Oh, audio. Uh, and you're just hearing some of the controls on my Zoom. Um, and we're going to uh, launch Desktop, Google Chrome. Chrome. Untitled Google Chrome. Be blank. Search, search landmark. Privacy, please. But button privacy, please. Toolbox. Let's do Google.com. Google. Dot document busy blank search land search and search combo box has auto -com. and here i can just uh i'm using the keyboard and just navigating through the web page button search by voice button google search button i'm feeling lucky google offered in link francis canada link advertising um and so uh i'm going to meeting control audio. Uh, stop the share and start my video so that you can hopefully uh see the braille display that uh, I, I am actually or have been using uh, to read these slides. Um, so I'm just going to hold this up. Uh, yep. So um, here uh, you'll see the pins. Um, they will come up uh, as uh, I move around the computer. Um, and the keys above, uh, these are uh, in the range, uh, arranged like a typewriter um, and are designed to input Braille uh, into the computer um, and also allows you to control the computer. But of course, um, this is an alternative. Um, and um, there are many of us uh, who uh, will use this uh, style of keyboard for input, but uh, we may also use just the typical uh, uh, standard QWERTY keyboard as well. So um, we've talked about the software uh, when it comes to assistive technology. Let's uh, talk about the hardware, the switch devices. Uh, so uh, replace the need to use a keyboard and mouse for navigation by allowing people with limited mobility access uh, to devices or content uh, by hand, finger, body, or eye tracking. Um, visual timers and schedulers. Uh, these allow users to smoothly transition from one task to another. Uh, augmentative and alternative communication, AAC for short. Uh, this means uh, it, uh, it means that it helps people to communicate when they have severe difficulties uh, with speech and language. Um, so this is uh, usually a um, physical and portable device. Speech recognition software. Um, I think many of us are familiar with this technology because we use Siri and our uh, Google Homes and uh, Echoes. Uh, but these allows users to navigate through software and apps on a computer or mobile device uh, write text and control other hardware devices by speaking commands. Um, so I guess the big difference with uh, the assistive tech 
um, that uses speech recognition is that it is more powerful, more customizable, uh, has many, many more settings. And now here we uh, will be talking about accessibility overlays, which is a hot topic uh, in the disability and accessibility community. Uh, so what are they? Accessibility overlays are products depicted as an automated solution that modify the code of a web page, often using JavaScript. These products are usually in the form of a plugin, app, toolbar, or widget, and the companies that create and promote the use of accessibility overlays claim their products automatically detect and fix web accessibility issues. Accessibility overlays and automation of remediation are far from perfect. These tools often fail to correctly identify problems in several areas, including keyboard traps. Uh, so navigating with the keyboard and getting stuck, not being able to move past the particular section. Um, and uh, this is common when you're inputting uh, text into a form field. Missing links, focus order, quality, and uh, relevance of image descriptions uh, and alt text. Um, use of layout tables, closed captions, inaccessible captchas, and misidentified language. Um, I should uh, pause here to uh, talk a little bit about alt text. Alt text is uh, simply um, an alternative uh, for screen readers to uh, let the user know what the image is. Uh, and so when the screen reader comes across an image, instead of just saying that it's an image, uh, if there is uh, Im an image description, a textual image description, uh, it will read that instead. Uh, and uh, you'll see us refer to this as alt text throughout uh, this presentation. Accessibility overlays always leave out both the technical points of website accessibility as well as the users themselves, thus resulting in exclusionary processes and products. Uh, and so, of course, the solution uh, is to encourage developers to make their website accessible uh, and implement accessibility, think about accessibility, even in the design phase. Inclusive design for physic, uh, digital spaces. The same seven principles of inclusive design we discussed earlier uh, in relation to physical spaces can also be used to guide the, 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 the the design of digital spaces and content so that it is inclusive and accessible for everyone. Procurement considerations. Um, here are some suggestions. Advocate for the procurement of digital content that is created with accessibility in mind from the beginning. Is WCAG compliant and has been tested by qualified individuals with lived experience? Uh, and so the thing to add here uh, is that um, even though many websites will say that they are WCAG compliant, sometimes the experience can still be poor uh, when it comes to the user's experience. And so um, even though uh, WCAG uh, is a useful standard, uh, we always encourage um, having the website or product tested by uh, persons with lived experience. Um, who uh, can provide the usability aspect. Digital accessibility in the library. So uh, we encourage you to learn how to make documents accessible. Uh, and we have a link here. Um, and uh, I will also just pause here to say that um, now we're talking about document accessibility. So not necessarily websites, but your Microsoft Word uh, documents or your PDFs and uh, that type of stuff. Uh, and uh, if you're using a Microsoft product, they have a built-in accessibility checker with some great tips. Um, we also encourage you to use automated website accessibility checkers to help catch some major barriers. Um, two suggestions are Lighthouse uh, and Axe. Um, 
We also encourage you to advocate for accessible websites, integrated system library systems uh, from the vendor or the entity responsible for maintaining or selecting them. Um, as you've seen uh, with a screen reader, uh, the one that I was actually demonstrating was NVDA. Uh, and this is a free screen reader. So um, one way to make your uh, public computers accessible is uh, by installing NVDA, non-visual desktop access uh, on these computers. We also encourage you to learn about the native accessibility tools in your existing technology. Uh, for example, Narrator, uh, which is the screen reader built into Windows and Magnifier, uh, which uh, is also in Windows as well. And other platforms also have their equivalents as well. So traditionally, people have referred to what is called a book family, famine. This, uh, not, this means that not all books have been made accessible to those with disabilities, creating a huge inequity to access the content. Even now, readers are waiting months, years, or never getting to read some titles because they're never created in an accessible format. Could you imagine only reading the same 10 old books your entire life? It is important for all people to see themselves in the public library community, not as an afterthought or a specialized service recipient. Integrating accessible resources into your library is a step toward an equitable reading landscape. So when it comes to formats, uh, we have audio formats. So we have MP3 or DAISY file types. Uh, these are audio materials that can be human narrated or use synthesized speech and can be played on almost any device, such as mobile phones, tablets, computers, some refreshable braille devices, and book players. Um, and so um, I think everyone is pretty much familiar with MP3. Uh, so what is DAISY? DAISY is a specialized format that offers greater navigational options, such as being able to move by page number, footnotes, endnotes, paragraphs, and phrases in addition to chapters and sections. Uh, and I'll also add here that DAISY uh, generally requires um, a player that supports that format, and these are players uh, that may be designed for readers with print disabilities. When it comes to ebooks, uh, we have EPUB 2 and EPUB 3, DOC, DOCX, RTF, TXT file types. Um, ebooks can be viewed on almost any device. Uh, and if created with accessibility in mind, they can offer rich navigation and access. There are more navigation options with some ebook file types than others. For example, TXT has no navigational features because it's plain text, while DOC, DOCX, and EPUBs do. Um, EPUB 3 is the goldmine for navigation and accessibility. Uh, and when we're talking about navigation, we're talking about being able to jump to different sections, uh, to links. Um, and other elements of a book, uh, such as uh, navigating through a table of contents as well, um, and, and that type of markup. Uh, so PDF file types. Um, PDFs, even when marked up, can pose challenges for users with disabilities. The inability to customize the reading experience uh, causes major barriers uh, for some readers, and also support for screen readers from PDF readers is still poor. So we recommend uh, avoiding using PDFs, or if you need to use PDFs, also think about creating uh, the same document in a more accessible format, like a Word document or have it up on a web page. Uh, so electronic Braille, uh, there is a specific format for this called BRF which is the Braille ready format. Uh, BRF files can be viewed on most refreshable Braille devices uh, with transcription software, such as Duxbury or Braille Blaster, or turned into hard copy Braille by printing or embossing on a Braille embosser, 
So the Braille embosser would pretty much be the equivalent of a uh, printer that prints out print with ink. Human transcribed VRFs reduce the rate of computer error in automatic uh, and computer translation Braille. And it allows for proper formatting to provide the user with more meaningful and accurate transcription of the print version uh, for the book. Uh, and uh, just to uh, clarify, um, when you turn a book into Braille, uh, you grab the text, you put it into uh, a transcription software, um, and it will apply the different rules and guidelines for Braille to the document and translate it into, uh, or transcribe it into Braille. Um, but then uh, because there are automatic errors, a, a transcriber will still need to uh, go through the book, uh, proofread it uh, one or uh, perhaps even several times um, to make sure that those errors are fixed, uh, which is why all Braille uh, should uh, be proofread by a certified Braille transcriber. So hard copy physical formats, um, these can include Braille and tactile graphics uh, or large print. Uh, large print is pretty much uh, um, a, a print copy with larger font um, and Braille, uh, this is hard copy Braille that's embossed using uh, an embosser. Um, and uh, tactile graphics uh, are images that can be felt with the hand uh, using raised lines and sometimes different textures. Um, and uh, it's important to note that some users still prefer to read physical formats despite it taking up more shelf space. Like print users, Braille and large print users should be given the same options. Hard copy formats often allow the reader to view more content at once, giving a better sense of layout. Uh, physical formats can be especially useful for technical materials, speeches, plays, maps, poetry, and cookbooks. Um, so uh, Canadian independent publishers uh, such as Nels, Sila, BA, and Q are working collaboratively to create born accessible digital content, as well as providing access to more specialized materials such as Braille and DAISY uh, and tactile graphics. Now uh, I'll pass it over to Rianne to talk about digital content providers. Other ways that patrons can obtain digital content is through usable services such as Overdrive and Hoopla. Some challenges with these services are that they're not always fully accessible, so can be difficult or impossible to use. For instance, there can be unlabeled buttons or links. And when buttons and links are not labeled with meaningful text, screen reader users are unable to determine the function of a button or a link before clicking them. It becomes a guessing game or a game of whack-a-mole to figure out where you're going. There can also be a lack of control over page layout, font type and size, and word and line spacing, which can be difficult for some people to read. Content relying on images, videos, or audio to give to convey meaning isn't accessible for all users or learning styles. They may be cluttered, complex in design, or overstimulating for other users. And updates may break accessibility, thus making the app less accessible compared to prior versions. So in the library, you can ask vendors if their products have been tested with assistive technology by qualified individuals with lived experience. Ask vendors if their products use accessibility overlays and call them out when they do. Collaborate with colleagues and other libraries about accessible procurement and consider advocating together. And you can support publishers who have committed to creating accessible content. And some of those can be found by looking for Benetech certification or uh, notes on their website saying that they are, um, you know, working toward 
certain uh, WCAG guidelines or accessibility standards and taking uh, have statements that say that they're they're committed to accessibility and accessible content and the creation of accessible content. So strategies for inclusive online events. Uh, so here are some suggestions. Um, ask participants in advance whether they need any accommodations. Uh, ensure that the sign up and registration process is fully accessible if applicable. Add a field in your registration uh, for people to indicate any accommodation needs. Uh, this should be optional um, because some people may not want to do this. Uh, mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, share screen and slides uh, and make them accessible. Uh, and if possible, share information in advance in uh, accessible formats. Uh, consider captions uh, and interpreter interpreters to accommodate people who are deaf, uh, hard of hearing, and uh, for those who uh, are taking part in a language that is not their preferred language. So uh, when it comes to uh, in-person event, uh, events, um, you'll see some of the same things. Uh, so ask participants in advance whether they need any accommodations. Uh, let participants know if there is access to accessible transportation and parking. Uh, create accessible slides and make them available electronically beforehand uh, and after the event. Uh, consider interpreters. Uh, offer to share information in advance in accessible formats. For example, a tactile map of the venue uh, and amplification for people who are hard of hearing. Uh, again, uh, ensure that the sign up process and registration um, is fully accessible if applicable. So, what can you do now for free? If your library uses social media, create accessible social media posts. Add alt text for images. Uh, use you describe for audio description uh, or ensure that the video can be followed with dialogue and sound alone and add captions. Auto-generated captions are okay, but we encourage editing generated captions for quality. Uh, for tips on creating more accessible social media posts, uh, we have a link uh, with more information. Uh, and only share posts that are accessible, for example, images that have alt text or videos with audio description and or closed captioning. Uh, and sometimes uh, we know uh, that it's difficult to tell if there is alt text on an image if you aren't using a screen reader. Uh, so um, in that case, uh, try using the browser extension. Uh, called visualize social media. Um, we also encourage others to add alt text for images uh, and audio descriptions uh, and closed captioning for videos. And finally, uh, welcome people with disabilities into your library with a warm smile. When helping people, always ask, never assume, and admit that you don't know all the answers, but you'll try your best to find them. That's what library staff does best, right? 